Okay, you guys, today is all about inverse functions. Got a couple of goals, a couple of main goals anyway. Goal number one, uh, to find the inverse of a given function. You guys have all done that before. We'll do it again today. Uh, goal number two, to verify using function composition whether or not two functions are inverses. That sounds like the way Yoda would say it, but I, th I, think, it, I think it makes sense. Okay, so we've got five recollections for you to make today. Uh, first of all, what is a function? It's a, f it's a set of ordered pairs, right? Inputs and outputs. The first coordinates are inputs, second coordinates are outputs, such that no two different ordered pairs have the same first coordinate. In other words, no two different ordered pairs have the same input. Uh, a function passes the vertical line test, remember? So what's the vertical line test say? So you graph a function. If any line, pa how, many li how many points can a, can a vertical line pass through an, at any part of the function? One. One, if it's gonna be a function, right? Okay. Um, we usually symbolize a function by y equals f of x. Number two, a function is one to one if no two different ordered pairs have the same second coordinate. A one to one fu function passes the horizontal line test, so no horizontal line will pass through a function at more than one point. Number three, the inverse of a function is obtained by switching the first and second coordinates and all the ordered pairs that comprise f. The inverse of f is denoted using the notation, okay, it looks like f to the negative one, but how do we read it? We, yeah, we, we actually say f inverse. This is, number four is very technical mathematical lingo. Uh, the domain and range of f and f inverse are flip-flopped. Very technical, right? Because if you, if you make an inverse function by switching the ordered pairs around, it makes sense that the domain and range would switch around as well. And then the most important property of inverse functions, number five. If you compose them, they undo each other. f of f inverse of x is equal to x. And it switches around too. f inverse of f of x is also equal to x. They knock each other out, right? Which is why we use inverse functions to solve equations. So uh, let's look at our first example. Is that graph a function? Yes, yes. yes why? It, 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 it is a function because it passes the vertical line test. So let's make mention of that. So in other words, uh, any vertical line you draw is only going to pass through the graph of the equation at one point, which means whatever x value this is right here, it's only going to correspond to one y value at this height, perhaps right there. Okay? That's where the vertical line, the vertical line test comes directly from the definition of the function. But okay, we're not that interested in the vertical line test in this one, but I just wanted to, to mention that. So, um, it is a function in the first place. It is, uh, and to be specific, I'm talking about the graph. So I'll say the graph represents a function, or the graph is a function, FCTN for short, because it passes a VLT, vertical line test, the vertical line test. But that's not what we were asked in this question. Is it a one-to-one -one function? No. no, it's not because it's not going to pass the horizontal, the horizontal line test. So it only takes one horizontal line to show it's not a function. Okay, this horizontal line passes through two points, which simply means that the x-coordinate of this point on the right, the x-coordinate of this point on the right, uh, well, I'm sorry, the y-coordinate, rather, of this point on the right is the same as the y-coordinate of this point on the left, so it can't be one-to-one. -one. Another way to think about it is you're not going to have peaks and valleys in a one-to-one -one function, right? It's going to either increase or decrease. It doesn't have to be a straight, it doesn't have to be a straight increase. It could increase like, like that, right? That would definitely represent a one-to-one -one function. It could decrease uh, maybe like that maybe decrease faster in some places and not as fast in others. But this is what a one-to-one -one function is going to look like. It's going to either increase or decrease. Um, and maybe almost level off, but never quite. 
So yeah, one, uh, a function with peaks and valleys not one-to-one -one by HLT. So your explanation here would be not, well, your answer would be not one-to-one. -one. And then your reasoning is by the horizontal line test. So if I asked you this question on a test, um, if the picture is not already there, you would draw the picture for me and then draw one horizontal line. Uh, and if it passes through more than one point, not, not a one-to-one -one function, right? Now, if it is a one-to-one -one function, you might want to draw a couple of horizontal lines just to say, because y you actually need it to be true for every horizontal line. For, for, for the function to be one-to-one, -one, every horizontal line has to, has to go through only one point. So draw, I mean, you can't draw every horizontal line going through the graph, but you could draw a few of them, right? So these ones, just to throw in an extra example, these ones would be one-to-one, -one. throw in a, a few vertical lines uh, by HLT. So you got two examples for the price of one there, or three really, for the price of one. Good deal. Any questions on the horizontal line test? Okay, all pretty old stuff for you guys, I think. Okay, uh, in this example, let's find the inverse. So how do you find the inverse of a function that's given as a finite set of order pairs? What are you gonna do? Don't you, um, oh, never mind. Yes. So if you just switch the x and y values around? Just switch the order pairs around. Oh. Yep, that's it. So, uh, by the way, I just want to point something out here. What's the domain of F? Dom F. 1, 3, and 5. The inputs, right? The first coordinates. And then what's the range of F? Uh, 2, 4, 6. So what is F inverse? Two one, four three. Four, three. Six, five. Yep, that's all there is to it. Now, what is the domain dom f inverse? Two four six. So just look at the inputs, first coordinates to get the domain. Especially when it's written as a finite set of ordered pairs, it's really easy. You can just scan it. And then, what's the range of f inverse? Look at the y coordinates or the second coordinates. So one, three, five. So what am I just having you note here? Yeah, so the domain and range of F or F inverse, however, wh whichever way you want to look at it, the domain and range of F inverse are the flip-flop of the domain and range of F. Easy enough? What would it mean if I asked you to find um, so I'm kind of adding stuff here just to kind of help you guys, uh, help, help you jog your memory a little bit. What would f of one be here? What would the function notation mean here? Two. F of one would be two. Does everybody see that? That's what the function notation means. So this is, this is more input output notation, isn't it? Input output. That's not, well, let's use a slash, well. Either way, either way I do it, it makes it look like an operation. But all I mean, I don't mean input minus output. All I mean is um, input, maybe I'll put a comma there. Input, output. Because if I put a slash, then it'll look like division. Okay, this is the input output notation, right? The function notation. F of one would be two. So, oh, the guy inside the parentheses here um, corresponds with the guy there as your first coordinate. And the output, of course, is the two, right? So the F notation is like, is like input output versus ordered pair notation. So what would, um, what would F inverse of two be? This is interesting to know. What would F inverse of two be? One. one. So do you see how they undo each other? f of one is two, but then if you run the output here through f inverse, you get the original input back again. So my point here then was they undo each other, f inverse of f of one, you just get the input left, right? 
And you know this is right because what is f of 1? f of 1 is 2. And what is f inverse of 2? f inverse of 2 is 1. So working it from the inside out, you can see f inverse of oh, f of 1, that's 2. So this is the same as f inverse of 2. In other words, f inverse of f of 1 is the same as f inverse of 2. And we know f inverse of 2 is 1. Big, the big headline is composition of inverse functions, they undo each other, right? Which is why we like them. They help us solve equations. Does that make sense? Uh, another thing we should note, in order for the inverse to be a function, what has to be true about f in the first place? It better be one to one, right? F better be one to one in order for its inverse to be a function as well. So I'll, let's make a note of that. Note. In order for F inverse to be a function, FCTN for short, F must be one to one. And that, that, that's actually really important for the theory that you, you develop, not only in this class, but in calculus. Uh, Well-defined one-to-one functions in, in many situations. They don't always have to be one-to-one. -one. In many situations, it's helpful. Okay, especially when you're finding inverses. So in that last example, we found the inverse for a, fin for a function defined using a finite set of ordered pairs. Now, if you think about it in part B, we have a function defined by an equation, which is an infinite number of ordered pairs. So there's going to be maybe a, a couple more steps here, right? Take a look at this. f of x is equal to x squared plus 3. And you're told that x, the input, has to be bigger than or equal to 0. So normally, what does f of x equal x squared plus 3 look like? It, yeah, it, it's a parabola, isn't it? So let's, let's graph this thing. If you think about it, x squared is a smiley face. Looks like a smiley face with the vertex at the origin, right? But the plus 3 is going to be a vertical shift up 3 of this base graph, right? Well, I don't want that base graph on there, so I'm just going to graph the, the parabola. So up 3. And I don't even want it to be that great of a picture. It's just a quick sketch. And it's actually faster to get a quick sketch by hand than dragging out your calculator. So I'm probably only going to plot three points here. So 0, 3, the vertex moves up 3. And then I think if you plot 1, it'll go through 4. It'll go through the point 1, 4. And if you plot negative 1, it'll go to a height of 4 as well. And you get this nice looking smiley face. However, it's not the whole graph, is it? If you don't make it through your point, make your point bigger. Uh, no. Well, you, don't, you guys don't follow that rule? Okay. Uh, however, I've graphed too much. I've said too much. Well, why? What's x allowed to be? Only positive or, or at, at the worst, zero. Which is going to erase one whole side of that graph. Which is good because it's not one-to-one, -one, right? As is, it's not one-to-one. -one. So uh, because x is only allowed to be greater than or equal to 0, all of this whole portion of the graph that has negative x values in their ordered pairs, you've got to erase it. In the ordered pairs that make up that whole left side, you've got to erase it. Now it is a one-to-one -one function, isn't it? OK. So let's. Let's go through some steps here for finding the inverse. The first step is going to be uh, usually a fairly simple one. You just want to verify that it's one to one because you're not going to be asked to find the inverse of something that's not a function. So verify uh, a one to one function, that is. Verify f is one to one. And that, you, you may need to draw a graph to do that. So that's why I, I drew the graph ahead of time. So clearly it's one to one because what test does it pass? Yeah, so clearly, clear, clearly it's one to one by HLT. 
And I want to note something here because it's going to help us later on. What's the domain? I'll just use D for domain here. And the domain's actually given to you in inequality form. Yeah, so in, um, so yeah, so in, in, in uh, interval notation, it would be from zero to infinity, and what kind of symbol around the zero? Bracket, because it's included, right? It's greater, x is greater than or equal to zero. So this is the domain of f, right? And what's the range of f? Well, no, look, look at the graph. Yeah, and, and think low to high. How low does it get? How high does it get? Does it hit every value in between? So three to infinity, right? It's a continuous graph, and it's, you know, it has height values defined from three to infinity. That's the range. Does it include the, th the uh, three? Yes. Yeah. So this is the domain and range of f. That's going to help us with f inverse. Okay. So that's step number one. Step number two, you're going to replace f of x with y. So um, with regard to this given problem, f of x is equal to x squared plus 3. I'm just going to write it as y equals x squared plus 3. The reason for that is there's less notation to deal with and you're more familiar with how x's and y's interact. So number three, okay, what did we do to find the inverse in part A when we were given just uh, a, a finite set of ordered pairs as, as your function? What did we do to find the inverse? Flip flop the x and the y. Right, now there's an infinite number of coordinates to deal with when the equation is, when, when an equation like y equals x squared plus 3 defines your function, but symbolically you can switch x and y easily, easily enough, can't you? So that's what we're going to do. Step 3 is going to be to switch x and y. So what does y equals x squared plus 3 become? x equals y squared plus 3. X equals y squared plus 3. And then you solve for y, yeah. But this is where it gets a little tricky if you're not careful. Solve for y. So I'm going to go ahead and write it as y squared plus 3 equals x. Let me do it in green just so we can differentiate here. Uh, y squared plus 3 equals x. And how do you solve that for y? That's a good start. So you get y squared is equal to what? x minus 3. Take the square root of both sides. Kay. Y equals the square root of x minus 3. Okay, but whenever we take the square root of both sides, well, I don't want to say whenever, because we're actually not going to do this here, but usually in the past when you're taking the square root of both sides, what do you put in, in front of the square root? Plus or minus. On the right side, positive. plus or minus. Well, it won't always be positive, well, though. In this, case. in this case, you're right, it will be. So how do you choose which root to use? Because we can't choose both, otherwise it, uh, your, your, your inverse function is not a function. It can't be both plus and minus, because then the plus and minus means you have two outputs for that input of x. So it can't be both, so how do you choose? Well, you choose it so that your domain and range are the flip-flop of the original function. So you have to choose either the plus or the minus to get the right domain and range, make sure, to make sure you have the right domain and range. So we know that the, do, what, what do we know the domain and range have to be? The domain has to be for f inverse, three to infinity, three to infinity and this is for f inverse, and the range has to be? Zero to infinity. Zero to infinity. Okay, so let's take a look at this then. When we take the square root of both sides, we do get just y on the left side, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the plus or minus there for just another second. So the outputs, I mean, clearly the input would be from three to infinity. So it's not so much the domain, I guess, right? Because if you, we're only allowed real valued functions here. If you tried to plug in something less than three for x, you'd have a negative underneath the radical, wouldn't you? 
So clearly our domain is good. It's the one we're supposed to get for the inverse. But it's the range, I guess, that we have to be really careful on. Because if you picked, say, the negative root, then what would the range, don't, don't look at this, don't look at, don't look at th what it's supposed to be, what would it be if you picked the negative root? It would go from, well, if you plugged in three, you'd get the opposite of the square root of zero. Yeah, so it'd be from negative, and then it would go down from there, right? Because if you plugged in anything bigger than three, the, the square root would be a positive number, but then you'd be taking the opposite of it, so it'd be negative. So you'd get negative numbers, or non-positive numbers, at least, if you pick the negative root. But that goes against what we know the range is. The range has to be from zero to infinity. So we pick the positive root. Does that little argument make sense? That's something that your intermediate algebra teacher probably didn't tell you about. It does get a little, little uh, tricky. And you, so you might see one in the homework where you have to take the negative root. So just be aware of that little argument. Does that make sense to you? So, so this is the right inverse. And then what are we gonna do in, let's call it step five? Replace y with, what notation do we use? Uh, yeah, so f inverse of x, and this is really function notation for the inverse function. So we get uh, f inverse of x is equal to the square root of x minus 3. And that's, that's your answer in this particular example. And then the steps in blue are kind of generalized steps you have to follow. Okay, in this example, we're going to let f of x be equal to 4 minus 1 divided by x and g of x equal to 1 divided by 4 minus x. Show f and g are inverses using function composition. So remember the big property, f inverse of f of x has got to equal what? x. x. And normally function composition doesn't commute, but it does for inverse functions. So that means also f of f inverse of x has got to equal x. For, for f and f inverse to truly be inverses of each other, this statement must be true. So this statement must be true for well, you know, in this particular example, they use f and g, so maybe I'll do that here. So in this particular, uh, particular example, we don't know for sure if, if f and g are inverses, but with regard to this particular example, then th it, this has to be true if they're inverses. g of f of x has to equal x, and it also has to be true that uh, f of g of x equals x. So must be true for f and g to be inverses. Which uh, creates a really simple way for us to check. We just, we just apply function composition going both ways and, and we better get x both times. So we don't even have to think about it, whether or not the functions are one to one. If one of them's not one to one, that'll come into play when you're doing the function composition. Okay, so, uh, and this is also a good reminder of function composition because it's been a while since you've done that. So, uh, let's compose. Uh, G of f of x, let's start with that. So, this is again called function composition. And what you really wanna do is work it from the inside out, okay? So, in place of f of x, you're gonna replace f of x with its formula on the inside. So what is the formula for f of x? Four minus one over x. So we're going to put 4 minus 1 over x in for f of x. So working downwards then, this g of f of x then is g of the formula for f of x which is 4 minus 1 over x. This is function notation, g of 4 minus 1 over x. 
So in the formula for G, we replace X with what? Yeah, so in the formula for G, the formula for G is one over four minus X. You're gonna replace X with four minus one over X. So that gives us one over four minus that whole, that whole thing. So one over four minus X, right, was the original formula. And in that X, we're gonna plug in the whole quantity four minus one over X. So let me pause for a second. I want, you, I want everybody to see this. Let me back off the view a little bit so you can take it all in. Okay. So does everybody see where that last equality comes from? Just from this formula, right? G of the quantity four minus X means in the formula for G, replace X with four minus one over X. Function notation, right? That's what it is. And then what happens in that denominator? It, once you distribute that minus, so let me, go, let me go back up here so you can keep everything in sight. Once you distribute that minus, what do you get? One over, so that equals one over, distribute the negative, what do you get? My, well, four minus four plus one over x. And so the fours in the denominator make zero. Four minus four is zero. You end up with one over one over x, and, and which is equal to x because you flip and multiply one times x over one, which is equal to x. So big check mark there. Everybody see that? But wait, there's more. What else do we have to check? So let's go and do that on the other side. So f of, do you see what we're doing, you guys? We're switching. this around, which I have trouble with. I, uh, I don't know if I have any, th dyslexia, there's a scale of dyslexia, I don't know if I have any of that, but I often switch things around. And, and there's a joke about dyslexia, and I don't wanna offend anybody, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. Okay, did you hear about the dyslexic devil worshiper? Did you hear about the dyslexic devil worshiper? No. He sold his soul to Santa. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's pretty lame, I know. Okay, so can you guys get me started here? F of, uh, I'll work downwards here since I did that in the other one. F of G of X, what's that equal to? So F of, we're gonna work from the inside out, F of the formula for G of X is one over four minus X. So I'm just replacing G of X with what it's equal to. We should be able to do that, right? And now it's function notation. You're, you're taking f of the quantity one divided by the quantity four minus x. So in the formula for f, what does that look like? So the original formula for f is four minus one over x, but instead of one over x, it's gonna be one over this big gigantic uh, one over four minus x, right? Well, it's not as bad as it could be, I guess. Everybody see that? All right, we'll do the algebra on that complex looking fraction there. What would that be? Yeah, okay, so you're gonna flip and multiply this guy, right? Times the one up top, so that becomes minus one times four minus x over one, and if you just wanna write four minus x, I, w I would not blame you, but this does remind you to do one thing. It does remind you that four minus X, even though you don't see the parentheses, you can put them in there, right? Because you need to distribute the minus one to the entire numerator there, four minus X. The, the former denominator, right? So yeah, otherwise you're not gonna get a positive X, are you? So, okay, so you do that, you distribute the minus one, what do you get? What you do, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to go incrementally here. So distribute that minus, and you do get four minus four plus x, or just x. So it's better that I go too slow than too fast, I think. So uh, check mark there, so what's your conclusion? The, oh, let's use a, a stuffy sounding word, thus. 
F and G are in fact inverses. Let's, let's change the view back to 100%, or as my son says, 100%. The Amazon Kindle is at 37%, Dad. He's only three, so that's pretty good. That he kind of knows a little bit about it, right? Um, he told a joke the other day. Did I tell you guys what it, no. about it? Um, it would be one of my lame jokes that I would tell you, but for a three-year-old, it's pretty good. He said, what do you get when you mix um, cold milk and warm milk? It's still milk. <laughs> it's not, I mean, think about who it's coming from. His mom and I were wondering, where did you hear that? And I'm not even sure he knew it was a joke, though. But he, he might have just been repeating what he heard. But I thought, but it was, it was cute. It's a little witty. So what? Witty. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think he totally understood it. But I, we don't know where he heard it, though. Um, and we pretty much keep track of his entire life, so I don't know how we missed that. <laughs> well, you know, there's the Friday nights, he goes out, parties, but other than that. <laughs> um, so uh, you can, given a function, you can draw an inverse function. Uh, as, you know, as long as your function is one to one. So let's make up a function f here. So there's the graph of f. Now, turns out, that there's a graphical meaning to switching the order pairs around. And uh, so that if you have the graph of F, even without knowing all the order pairs, you can get the graph of F inverse. So it turns out switching the order pairs around will reflect the graph of F across the line Y equals X. So F inverse, let's write that down. F inverse is the reflection of the graph of F, well, I, I, technically I should have said the graph of, but I get tired of writing that. The graph of F inverse is the reflection of the graph of F across the line Y equals X. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw that line y equals x, and it would be easier if, if this were square, but it's pretty close to being square as far as the scaling goes. Okay, so there's the line y equals x. All right, so points that are on the line aren't gonna go anywhere w when you find the inverse. So a point like, uh, let's do the inverse in green, I guess. A point like this, which is right on the line, is going to stay on the line. Same with this guy. Same with whatever that guy is. And then a point like 0, 1 is going to be reflected across the line. You can, you can see it here, too. So 0, 1 looks like it's on the graph of F, right? And if you reflect it across the line, so what do I mean by reflecting across the line? Well, you make the image point. Well, you, you know what it is, right? If this is at 0, 1, the image point has to be at 1, 0, right? And so let me, let me zoom in on this to show you what's, what I really mean here. 200 percent. So the, uh, the image then, so imagine this is our point, and imagine taking it across uh, moving it across or re reflecting it across this line, y equals x, um, perpendicularly, same distance opposite side of the line. Where do you end up at? Instead of being at 0, 1, you're at 1, 0. So this point is on the um, graph of f inverse. Does that make sense? You can really see it with, when, when the coordinates um, are on the axes. Okay. So we get a few of those and we can draw a decent graph of F inverse. So uh, what else? Well, we could take maybe this point, it's kind of the furthest away, right? And reflect it, I'm just eyeballing it. Uh, over here, let's see. Over here somewhere, right? And then this point maybe over here. 
Again, I'm eyeballing it. It's not going to be a work of art. And then I think I have enough to get a decent looking graph. Okay. So connect these points. Eh, let me do it in green. It's not, the contrast isn't good enough. Okay. So I'm heading towards, where am I heading towards? This one, right? And then I'm headed towards this one. And then back. And so that curve in green then is a good approximation of F inverse. Make sense? Yeah? Close enough? Yeah, it's not perfect over here. It looks like I got it a little too wide, but you get the idea. So here I'm telling you F of 3 is equal to negative 5. And F inverse exists, so F must be 1 to 1. Name a point on F inverse. Say it again. Yeah, how'd you get that? Yeah, so this is just the input output notation for what point? Yeah, if f of 3 equals negative 5, then th that means 3, negative 5, the point 3, negative 5 is on the graph of f. Does that make sense? So automatically, you know how to find the graph of f inverse. You flip all the ordered pairs around. So automatically then, negative 5, 3 must be on the graph. I'll, I'll put, use ditto marks. Is on the graph of f inverse. Does that make sense to you? Okay. 